Welcome back to Rocky Mountain Prepper. I'm Bellum. This time we are continuing our Strong Foundation series where we are walking through the Bible. Last time we were here they made it to Mount Sinai and Moses was instructed to have them build a fence around the mountain so no one would try to go up. All right. So Exodus 20, that would be in Hebrew, Shemot 20. And Elohim spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery. You have no other mighty ones against my face. You do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them or serve them, for I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous God, a jealous El, or jealous God, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving commitment to thousands to those who love me and guard my commands. You do not bring the name of Yahweh, your Elohim, to naught, for Yahweh does not leave one unpunished who brings his name to naught. Remember the Sabbath day to set it apart, or keep it holy. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. You do not... Uh, yeah, you do not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. Respect your, fa your father and your mother so that your days are prolonged upon the soil which Yahweh, your Elohim, is giving you. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's house do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor whatever belongs to your neighbor. And all the people saw the thunder and lightning flashes, the voice of the shofar, and the mountain smoking, and the people saw it, and they trembled and stood at a distance. And Moses and, and said to Moses, You speak with us and we hear, but do not but not bah, but let not Elohim speak with us lest we die. Um, honestly if God was talking to me out of a mountain that's smoking and there's all kinds of lightning and a shofar blowing, I'd be terrified too. This is understandable. Most people I know would be terrified. 
There are a few crazy people that I've met that would not be terrified and they would be curious and wanting to go up there. It is a good thing to fear God. I mean, look what he did to Egypt. He has power greater than we could comprehend. We are to fear and love him. And Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for Elohim has come to prove you in order that his fear be before you, so that you do not sin. So the people stood at a distance, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where Elohim was. And Yahweh said to Moses, Say this to the children of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from the heavens. You do not make besides besides me mighty ones of silver, and you do not make mighty ones of gold for yourselves. Make a slaughter place of earth for me, and and you shall slaughter on it your ascending offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your cattle in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. I shall come to you and bless you. And if you make me a slaughter place of stone, do not build it of cut stone. For if you use your chisel on it, you have profaned it. Nor do you uh, nor do you go up by steps to my slaughter place, lest your nakedness be exposed on it. These are the right rulings which you are to set before them. When you, by a Hebrew servant, he serves six years, and in the seventh year he goes free for naught. If he comes if he comes in by himself, he goes out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go with him. If his master has given him a wife, and she bore him a, bore him sons or daughters, the wife and her children are her masters. And he goes out by himself. If the servant truly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, let him let me not go out free. Then his master shall bring him before Elohim and shall bring him to the door or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Now I don't honestly like the idea of slavery. But this wasn't really slavery. This is more indebted servitude. Um, you're working off a debt. That's more how they, how scholars have interpreted this, and I tend to agree with that, given the language. At the time, there was still slavery. Even the people of Israel did take slaves, but mostly those slaves were slaves taken in battle. Yeah, that's still an iffy topic, but if we go according to the the laws set out, no one will be permanently in debt in servitude. You let your servants go, unless they want to be with you. And they also te and it also says in various places in the Bible, they as a master you are to care for them and treat them well. I don't like the idea of slavery, ever. I mean, honestly, if someone wants to work with for me, uh, I'll find a way to pay, pay them. They're not going to be a servant. Uh, and when the man sells his daughter to be a female servant, 
she does not go out as a male servant, as the male servants do. If she is displeasing to the eyes of her master, who has engaged her to himself, then he shall let her be ransomed. He shall have no authority to sell her to a foreign people uh, because of him deceiving her. And if he has engaged her to his son, he is to do to her as is the right of daughters. If he takes another wife, her food, her covering, and her marriage rights are not to be diminished. Uh, that's basically saying if you have a second wife, you have to treat both of them equally. They both must be cared for properly. I myself can never seem to uh, keep one woman happy, so why would I want to have a second? I mean, let's be honest. I'm a one-woman guy. But this is cautionary to those who feel the need to have multiple women, I guess. And if he does not do these three for her, then she shall go out for naught, without silver. He who strikes a man so that he, do, that he dies shall certainly be put to death. Uh, we did see this one uh, before in Genesis, after they got off the ark. If a man takes the life of a man, his life is forfeit. God is just foot stomping it here. You don't kill someone. There are extenuating circumstances, like you're protecting someone, or you're in the military and you are ordered to go to battle. Those are acceptable to God. The military, it's not on the soldiers. In the military, it's on the politicians who failed to prevent the war. Uh, but if he does not die, if he does, uh, but if he did not lie in wait, but Elohim delivered him into his hands, then I shall appoint for you a place where he is to flee. But when a man acts presumptuously against his neighbor to kill him, yeah, to kill him by treachery, you are to take him, even from my slaughter place, to die. And he who strikes his father or his mother shall certainly be put to death. And... He who kidnaps a man and sells him, or, if he is found in his hands, shall be, shall certainly be put to death. Um, that actually goes down to show the mercy that Joseph paid his brothers. God just now says if you kidnap, your, kidnap someone and sell them, your life is forfeit. Well, that's what Joseph's brothers did. So, Joseph, by forgiving, actually showed great mercy. And, and he who curses his father or his mother shall certainly be put to death. And when men strive together, and one strikes the other with a stone or with his fist, and he does not die, but is confined to his bed, if he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck him shall be innocent. He only pays for lost time and sees it and sees to it that he is completely healed. And when a man strikes his male or female servant with a rod, so that he dies under his hand, he shall certainly be avenged. But if he remains alive a day or two, he is not avenged, for he is his property. And when a man strives, when men strive, and they shall 
smite a pregnant woman and her child come out, yet there is no injury, he shall certainly be punished according to according as the woman's husband lays upon him, and he shall give through the judges. But if there is injury, then you shall give life for life, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, lash for lash. Uh, that actually is the old hemorrhagic code right there. Uh, I personally feel that forgiveness is better than revenge. The old there's an old saying that when a man seeks re, uh, goes out for to seek revenge, he should dig two graves. Well, you go out after to avenge some crime against you, someone's going to come after you. That's why that saying states, yes, God says that you may do this and be forgiven by him for the action. But honestly, forgiving people is much better. It is hard, but life is too short to hold on to that hate. Um, and when a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he is to let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he is to let him go for free, or let him go free for the sake of his tooth. And when an ox go, gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall certainly be stoned, and its flesh is not eaten, and the owner of the ox is innocent. However, if the ox it was previously in the habit of goring, and its owner has been warned, and has not kept it confined, so that it has killed a man or a woman, the ox is stoned, and the owner shall be put to death. If a sin covering is laid upon him, then he shall be given the ransom of his life. Whatever is laid on him, Whenever it has gored a son or gored a daughter, according to this right ruling, it is doing to him. If the ox gores a male or female servant, he is to give the master thirty shekels of silver, and the ox is stoned. And when a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit, and does not cover it, and an ox or donkey falls in it, the owner of the pit is to repay. He is to give silver to the owner, and the dead beast is his. And when the ox of a man smites the ox of, an, of a neighbor, and it, and it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the silver from it, and also divide the dead ox. Or, if it was known that the ox was previously in the habit of goring, and its owner has not kept it confined, he shall certainly repay ox for ox, while the dead ox, uh, the dead beast, is his. These are all just little things. Um, as slaves, they didn't have property. So they had to be taught, this is what you do, this is how you do it. If they, had if they had never experienced slavery in Egypt, God could have given them these little things slowly over time. But since they were in bondage, they had to 
uh, be told all of this stuff straight out. All right, we are going to stop here for the day, and we'll continue next time. Thank you for reading along. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Thank you again, and as always, good luck, and God bless all of you.